compared to my good life at Nupi, of course, uh, it's different in the sense that I'm back to being an, an actor among many, uh, and perhaps with less time to reflect on what is the situation. Uh, and indeed, NRC, the organization I lead, is a big actor. Um, we, uh, we have 3,000 staff members in Syria or Iraq or in the neighboring countries working with Syrian and Iraqi uh, refugees. And I'm also um, a special advisor uh, for the UN mediation effort in charge of the humanitarian and protection of civilian side. So I deal with Russian colonels every week. Uh, I deal with uh, American diplomats every week, and I see many of the challenges that my colleagues here have uh, described in the flesh, if you like, and, or, and so many of the, the problems. Okay, uh, so before you stand up, uh, Sverre, and nobody stands up like you, um, <laughs> uh, let me try to describe the, uh, the, 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 the challenges and then uh, uh, hint on some of the, the lessons. Um, now, uh, how do I, where do I? The one. Okay. So this, these are refugees in the world. It's actually NRC and UNHCR that together uh, accumulates the number of refugees and internally displaced on Earth. These are people displaced by conflict. It was hovering between 40 and 45 million all, all the time from 20, 2005, basically, until 2012. What happened? 2012. It went through the roof. And there were different explanations, but the number one explanation is the war in Syria. Uh, we haven't seen a war like that since the Second World War in terms of displacement. I mean, more people were killed, uh, many more people were killed in Rwanda and, 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 and some of the uh, genocides of the 90s but we haven't seen these kind of displacement uh, figures. So uh, just to recapitulate, 6.6 .6 million are internally displaced within the borders, and most of them cannot escape. It's, it's a myth that the borders are open to, to, uh, to Turkey, Jordan, uh, uh, Lebanon, Jordan, and uh, Iraq. They are not. The one border that has been most open has been to Turkey, but that's also really close. They have no escape, the 6.6 .6 million. On top of that, there are some 7 million others who are within their local communities and need help, emergency relief. Then in the neighboring countries, well, it's now 5 million, really. Uh, if you count for non-registered refugees, it's many more. Altogether, 18 million people in need need humanitarian assistance. Within Syria, in the neighboring country, as, uh, or, and, and if I had added uh, Iraq, and I, I agree with Morten, I mean, Iraq is, it's, it's the same war, basically, now, uh, the Iraqi and the northern, the northern Iraqi and the Syrian war it would have been 30 million people in need of assistance. It's a tremendous, tremendous challenge. My specific responsibility has been to try to lead the uh, diplomatic efforts of 22 countries in the International Syria Support Group, ISSG, to get relief to an, anywhere between 15 and 20 besieged areas in many more hard to reach areas. This is the kind of a map we present each week in the weekly meetings in, um, in uh, Geneva, where these 22 countries send their envoys. And, and what we show is each place where you have a, um, a truck with a figure, it shows places that there have been cross-line, cross-frontline convoys to either besieged or hard-to-reach areas. And each place that is red, these are for 
people under the age of 40 uh, or 30 perhaps, uh, uh, the red dots are, rec are besieged areas, green hard to reach areas. What's the difference? Well, the definition of a besieged area for the UN is an area with full military encirclement and no um, uh, humanitarian access to or movement of civilians from for at least three months. That's the definition of uh, besiegement. Other organizations have other definitions. They have a lower period, for example, and they have many more people in besieged areas. All in all, um, we, we were able to reach nearly all of the besieged areas in 2016 thanks to diplomatic efforts of this, uh, this group. In 2015, we reached two out, they reached two out of 16 areas. This year, we reached uh, all but one, really, East Aleppo in the period where, when it was besieged. This, um, so who's besieging? Um, two areas, Kefraya and Fuwa in Idlib, are besieged by armed opposition groups. Arar al-Sham, uh, mostly. The, how many people there? Maybe 15,000 people only now. Then there is this area, Deir Sur, which is besieged by Islamic State. And the only way to reach this is with airdrops, which we do from 3,000 meters height. And then you, you have um, a logarithm uh, kind of based uh, airdrop with air and uh, all sorts of meteorological data go into it. And then they are able to reach a football field in Deir Sur, And that's the way that place is fed. The rest of the areas, they were 15, now 13, because two were overrun by the army, the Syrian army. The rest of the, all of the areas are really besieged by the Assad government. So it is the Assad government that is with allied forces, Hezbollah mostly, that are responsible for most of the besiegement has been so throughout the war. Very many of these areas is, is around Damascus very close to Damascus, many of them. Duma, it's a, it's a suburb. It's uh, Guru Dalen being besieged. It is, uh, uh, you know, Bekistu are being uh, besieged, whatever. Small places or larger places, and they are, many of them have been besieged now for two, three years with one occasional convoy coming through. Now, <clears throat> um, well, what is this? This is, this is the uh, besieged zone of East Aleppo. We put here protection on that one. <laughs> Why we put protection? Because, you know, as much as people have suffered in the hard to reach and besieged areas of Syria, it's not calorie intake which has been the biggest problem. There are many more people uh, starving, uh, really hungry in, in a horrible state because of a lack of assistance in Yemen or in Nigeria or in South Sudan than in Syria. The problem in Syria is protection. People are not. We feed them, we help them, but we do not protect them and they are ultimately then driven out of their homes. That's to me the story of, of Syria. And typically what happened in East Aleppo, I, I came here, I, I drove here in in the spring of, um, of 2003, just after having left uh, Nupi, I was with Human Rights Watch. We took a, a taxi, Human Rights Watch, from uh, Turkey, and we went down here. This area was not held by government forces at the time. This was all, all of this was um, opposition held, but this was position held even at that time. The front line was here even at that time. And the Scud missiles were hitting uh, Syria, uh, Aleppo at the time. The war went through Aleppo. Uh, the front went through Aleppo then for now how many years? Four years. They had the front, active front through the middle of the city. Then the whole thing changed this last summer, and the red, the government 
took then um, went came through here and took Castello Road, which is the lifeline into East Aleppo from here. And the government, the um, these forces and these forces were able then to liberate, as they call it, um, the this area, Ramusa Gate, and for a while in July, two weeks, there was some, some contact. But basically, since uh, mid, uh, early July, East Aleppo was doomed. It was only a time before it would fall or be liberated, depending on whom you speak to in the group that I chair. And people were bombed every single day, and all hospitals were bombed, not, not, not a single one was not bombed repeatedly. Schools, bread lines, bakeries, etc. Protection crisis. But, but they didn't starve, as, as many people think. They were just uh, hammered uh, in, in violation of humanitarian law. Um, Julia mentioned the evacuation from uh, East, East Aleppo, and, uh, and true, <laughs> it was uh, Russia, uh, uh, number one, uh, helped with um, Turkey that made the deal that was made us be able, us being ICRC and SARP, Syrian Arab Red Crescent, and the UN with 30 NGO partners, organize <coughs> the um, evacuation. At that point, this was left. This area was left of, of uh, East Aleppo. Interestingly, just showing all of the elements uh, here, Sheikh Maksud is a Kurdish-held area which was part of East Aleppo, but was none of the two sides wanted to fight really the Kurds. And so that was, has been maintained as, as a separate area. People were then fleeing into West Aleppo or into um, at the east government co uh, control areas as the front lines were shifting. Or they went and be became cramped in this area. And in this area, the most, uh, the, 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 the hardest, hardcore opposition Islamists, Nusra, etc., then were in the, in the end, with their families. Against all odds, and with a thousand uh, phone calls and emails, etc., around the clock and a hundred crises, we were able then to organize this escape of 36,000 people, ended up in Idlib, some all the way up to Turkey, to uh, the medical uh, cases, or to rebel-held West Aleppo. Um, it, was, uh, it, it was the, the an escape that was needed. It could have become a, a horrific massacre if it was the fighting house by house. Ending uh, as you stand up, um, uh, this uh, just show how do we work then? Well, this is what, what, this is the pre-meeting before the big ISSG meeting. And who sits there? Well, the American diplomats, only three of them now at this. Maybe it's a, it is an interesting display. Uh, uh, now, two uh, Russian colonels, just American diplomats, American uh, Russian military and diplomatic staff. And we here discuss how what we do when we go in to the full meeting. In the full meeting, then, uh, the UN presents from Damascus and from Gaziantep and from Amman the state of affairs. And then we try to assign homework to the Russian and Iranian side to influence the government, to Americans, Turks, Saudis, and others to influence the, um, the armed opposition groups. Uh, and some do homework, and interestingly, the Russians do their homework, and most of the others, and the Americans do, but they have little influence, and most of the others do not do their homework uh, the way it is. And then you end up uh, with 
25 uh, television cameras. Uh, after the stuff in the Mistura is a coach here. And it becomes big news in Turkey and in Iran and in Russia and all of that. And whatever we say, we're criticized afterwards for being biased, either by the Russian side or by the Turkish side or by the Saudi side or by the American uh, side. And the talks, I think, will be in Geneva after the intro in Astana, where, 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 where the Russians and the Turks will have their show, but I think they're already seeing it's more difficult than they thought to, to run it. But they, yes, indeed, it will start there, but it will start in Mr. run it in Geneva from 8th of February, we hope. Thank you.